Now. Good evening. Welcome to Covenant Bible Fellowship. Yes, good evening. No. Um, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will get to take a look at this together. Lord, thank you so much for giving us your insights through your word. Thank you for speaking the word. And um, as uh, John says, that you are the word. Um, so, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to get to know you better tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, as you all know, we're going through Matthew. We've been looking in Matthew chapter 5 uh, over the last couple times. Um, that's because it's quite detailed. There's a lot to it, uh, and I don't want to overlook anything that's um, really worth, you know, uh, dredging out and, and covering. But at the same time, if we did that, we would never get past any part of Scripture because all of it's, you know, rich with amazing uh, truth. So what we're doing is we're hitting some highlights. Um, we've been hitting some highlights. If I miss some stuff, that's kind of, you know, it's going to happen. Um, but still, we, uh, we're we trying to get, grab a lot of the, uh, the, the truths, if you will, that are in Matthew. I want to start this off by making sure that um, we don't make the wrong uh, assumptions or take the wrong approach. Um, we have a tendency as Christians, and I'm going to say we, I'm going to speak for all of us as if I know. Maybe I don't. Um, but we have a tendency as Christians to uh, eat, go one of two ways. One way we decide that since we worship God in spirit and in truth, we don't need to look at scripture or fellowship with the believers all that much. We need to you know, rely on grace and not the law, and therefore we sort of end up being maybe pamby Christians. Uh, and that's, I, I say that, and that may be offensive to some people, but it's what you end up being. You're, you're disarming yourself. Um, you're throwing down your sword, you're forgetting your shield, you're discarding your breastplate of righteousness, and you're just, you know, as the song says, marching into the enemy camp and laying your weapons down. It's, it's a little foolish. Um, at the same time, then we have other people who are scared of or are, you know, dedicated to not doing that. And they're very quick to point out when others do that. And they say, oh, you're a Mambi Pambi Christian, right? Um, and these people end up becoming legalists. Um, they look at scripture as if it has all the answers, which it does. Uh, and then they try to follow those answers to the T in order to make sure that they are the perfect Christian. And, and they, you know, and, they and, and then they fail and everyone looks at them and says, look, it's yet another fill in the blank who has failed. You know, look at how the church is full of hypocrites. You can't set yourself up as a, a shining beacon of righteousness to the world. You're not. God is right. Um, we are we are candles in the darkness, not because we shine righteousness to all of the the poor uh folks out here who are so lost and you know alone we we come into the world with an understanding of the fact that guess what we're lost and alone but we need it. right we're, we're lost and alone too you know the only reason that 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 we aren't is because we have the light within us so the light that anybody sees is the light of christ shining through so there's a an element of humility that we have to take when we're looking at scripture so i, I think i've talked on that enough but I think it's important when we look at things like Matthew to recognize that while we can draw a lot of very clear lines and we can make some fantastic charts and answer yes, no questions about what is good and what's not good and how does the law, you know, adjudicated and whatnot like we looked at last time, this is not a primer into being a legalist. This is a, uh, a, a way of us delving into the mind of God. This is how we get to know God, right? If you love God, then you want to spend time with him. You want to get to know him. And guess what? The word was with God and the, the word, word was God. That's why I mentioned that earlier. Um, so I think it's very important for us to recognize that. Now, last week we ended on the note of um, do we actually resist evil or not? And it was kind of up in the air-ish. And I made the comment that, you know, it was physical versus spiritual uh, and that we would be looking into it a little bit more this week. So, indeed, we are. Um, we're going to be looking at the section in Matthew, which ends, But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And, of course, it, it goes on, but that is verse 39. 
Uh, and so we have uh, uh, this blanket statement that says, and I quote, resist not evil, right? Seems pretty straightforward, pretty uh, ex self-explanatory. But at the same time, we also have this lovely little statement in uh, 1 Corinthians. Let me get uh, someone to look up uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 5.13 and someone else to look up James 4, verse 7. Okay, I have 5.13. You have 1 Corinthians 5.13. Go ahead and read that. 1 Corinthians 5.13. But them that are without God judge it. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. The wicked person. Okay. So we have a wicked person. And then what's the other one? James 4, 7. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Ooh. Okay. So we have a mention of the, a wicked person, but then we also have a mention of the devil. Now, when it says the mention of that wicked person, you're supposed to be putting him out of your number, but it also clearly says in Matthew, resist not evil. If he wants to take your cloak, give it to him. You know, if he wants to sue you, let him have it. If he wants to, to you know, as the Romans did, force you to walk a mile carrying his stuff, offer to go two miles, he smacks you on the cheek, turn your other cheek to him. Don't resist that evildoer. If a person is being spiteful, arrogant, whatever, uh, abusing their power, uh, show them the love of God by giving them grace they don't deserve. In other words, don't return evil for evil. Don't return evil, evil will, for evil. Stand in love. Huh? Right. Okay. So that makes more sense, sort of. And yet the confusion could come into this verse by saying what in verse 39? Resist not evil means don't fight the devil. Now that's not true, because go ahead and read uh, James four seven one more time. I'm not there now. Uh. <laughs> it says what? To resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Okay, so uh, we're given this command uh, to resist the evil one, uh, but at the same time, we're told that the evil ones uh, were supposed to show them grace. Now, uh, define evil for me. That's a big question. That's a philosophy question. Oof. The opposite of righteous. Opposite of righteous, okay. DWP. DWP. <laughs> yes, if you're from California, the DWP. No, I'm not going <laughs> to throw my political beliefs into this, but no, um, it is in, is, in essence, one who goes against a moral law, or in this case, the moral law, right? Um, there is uh, an ongoing debate in every circle of the internet. You show up to a cooking site, invariably someone will be talking about how much they hate God and how much you need to be saved, and it'll go back and forth until it's a screaming match and a YouTube commentary, right? Um, this is something we've all recognized. If you're a denizen of the internet, as I am, you'll inevitably get tired of people arguing over the internet. But it's not just confined to the internet. This is something that's been going on for, you know, all time. Um, people who believe in God feel that it is their duty to assist others who do not believe in God to come to such belief, mainly because um, mercy, right, that's one reason, or as I said earlier, duty, right, they believe that they're required to do so, they believe that um, it is a good thing, maybe they're a, as I was talking earlier, a, a legalist and they want to pile up more good things on their good things side, it doesn't matter what their reasoning is, they're trying to promote the idea of God and there are anti-God people who come on the other side to oppose them and there's this clash, right. Um, I had the interesting experience of inadvertently entering one of those conversations, and, and a gentleman claimed to be um, not an atheist, but an anti-theist. Right. Because he made the claim, he said, you know, I recognize that uh, religion is evil. Because I get to determine what is good and evil on because the basis on, on the basis of whether or not it promotes society, and based on that objective um, 
perspective of mine, looking at history, I can determine that, at least from my point of view, uh, religion has held humanity back, and therefore religion is bad, and therefore I do not necessarily think that there is or isn't a God, I just think that religion itself is wrong, uh, and so his whole perspective was framed around being anti-God. I have a friend that's like that. Yep. And I have entered in discussions with him. He, all the wars in the past history, almost all, right. are, are religious in... In nature, tied to religion in some way. A few way. that were strictly territory, but most of it was religion. Okay. So um, th this perspective, and, and I think he actually did a good job of describing himself. I think that that was an on-point description because there are a lot of people who claim to be atheists when they're actually anti-theists, right? Now, um, the, the now legendary um, statement made by uh, Penn Jillette, uh, is brought up in a lot of churches as the respectful atheist, right? right? One who recognizes that some people can really believe in God, and so he kind of lets them alone. He has the perspective of a true atheist. He simply does not believe God exists. You can believe what you want. He'll believe what he wants. Everybody let everybody alone, right? It's almost libertarian in he is philosophy. A libertarian. Okay, well, that makes sense. He's, he's, being, uh, true to his. he's being true to his own philosophy. That's good. But um, he had the common sense, if you will, to state that I can't control your beliefs, therefore I'm not going to judge you on the basis of your beliefs, and I would like it if, you know, you respected that for me by not judging me on the basis of my beliefs. Everybody let, leave everybody alone. That's very much something that could fall into atheist, you know, which is I don't believe there's God, as opposed to anti-theist, which is I believe God is bad. Right. Right, or at least that the idea of God is bad and that following God is bad. So there's there are these militant atheists, as other people term them, who are on the warpath to destroy religion. Um, and these people fall clearly under what Matthew uh, 5.39 is talking about as being what? The evildoer, right? This is the evil that we're, we're talking about. And that's not Satan. Satan clearly knows who's the boss. When God, oh, yes. when God tells him to do something, he has to. Grumbling all the way. Sure. Grumbling all the way, but he has to. He's under authority whether he likes it or not because God's authority is absolute. God's sovereign. God, as, you know, it, <clears throat> contrary to some people's beliefs, God is very much authoritarian. Um, you do not have the ability to violate God's dictates. When God says gravity exists, there is no way for us to negate that. All right. Um, there are certain things in the moral law that we can break, and that makes us evil, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. We can have that discussion at another time. Um, getting back to Matthew, however, it says, But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee. Turn not thou away. Um, in Ellicott's commentary, uh, he says that the Greek in Matthew 5.37 uh, is talking about not the evil one, like we see in um, James, James 4.7, where it says definitely do resist evil. Right. right? It's talking about the evil ones um, with the emphasis of being a human evildoer. In fact, it's the same term used in 1 Corinthians 5.13 that I had you pull up earlier. So we're, we're looking at the resisting of Satan, right? That's the spiritual battle we've been called to do. We were called to that fight. That's what it says in Ephesians, right? right. We wrestle not against flesh and, blood. flesh and blood. That's the evil ones. People. But we wrestle against... Spiritual powers, wickedness of, you know, powers and principalities, powers and, principalities and, and the, you know, rulers of darkness of this world. Right. There is a clear divide made between the two, uh, and I think Ephesians ex is explaining well why these two things can coexist. How can you both resist not evil and, you know, resist evil? If, if it helps, I pulled up the strong definition of evil out of Matthew. Sure. All right. Basically, it comes down to degenerate. 
removed from its original virtue, mm -hmm. often calamitous, uh, ill, diseased, morally culpable, derelict, vicious, malice, guilt-ridden, um, bad, grievous, harmful, lewd, malicious, and then wicked. Sure. Okay. So that pretty clearly defines the anti-theist. Right. This is a person who wants to escape the realities of moral degradation right. and of moral absolutes. Um, Hurtful. If, hmm, how am I going to put this? If, if it's my fault, um, then I have to handle it and I have to fix it. If it's someone else's fault, then I can push it away from myself. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, there has been a, a drive recently, and this is probably not going to be very politically correct, so I apologize about that. But there's been a drive recently, and I say recently in historians' terms, um, to push what used to be considered personal responsibility into the realm of disease. Right. Um, you know, I... I have heard more often than I can say uh, people saying something along the lines of, you know, I have anxiety. Okay, you have anxiety. That's great. That's a that's a good place to start, right? You can grab onto that. I, I had guilt for a long time, and there was a reason for me to have guilt. I had guilt because I'd done bad things. Um, and so that was a place for me to start. But when you when you move beyond that, I hear people that are happy, excited, in a good place, and they say, oh, yeah, I got real bad anxiety. No, you don't. You're kind of doing all right right now. Oh, no, I, not right now. You know, I just, I have anxiety, so it'll happen sometimes. You mean you get anxious. Right. Right, I have anxiety. No, 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 no. You don't have anxiety. It's not a disease. Right. You get anxious. All right, so we progress, as you will, towards this idea of pushing away our moral culpability. Um, there you go. That's a nice small word for it. Excuses, right? We like excuses. Um, I, I'm not stealing things. I was born and raised in an environment in which it was natural for me to survive any way that I can, and therefore it's something I can't help when I'm just taking things. So you misappropriate. Right. I'm a klepto. Right. Or, or I'm a klepto. No, you're a thief. Right. You steal things. Right. The moral law is absolute. It does not see those boundaries. It does not see those lines. It does not say, oh, you poor dear, you grew up in a bad household, therefore you're allowed to be angry and be abusive and beat people. No, you're not allowed to be angry. You're not allowed to be abusive. You're not allowed to beat people. That's it's wrong. understandable, but there's no. a way of fixing it. Right. I mean, there, there, there is something to be said for reasons, but there's Grace. nothing to be said for excuses. Excuses mean nothing, right? Reasons, we can understand. I can see the reasoning behind. In fact, that the, the moral law says that. In the Old yes, Testament, it, it says, you know, if a man steals bread to feed himself when he is hungry, who's going to blame him, right? He Seriously, he's got, a, he's got a reason. But at the same time, if you catch him, he's still going to have to pay it back because that is the law. But if he's a malicious thief stealing just to steal, that has a different... And that does. It has a completely different connotation. So there is something to be said for reasons. There's nothing to be said for excuses. Excuses have no place in the court of law, and they have no place in God's court of law either. So um, this moral responsibility and a mindset of moral responsibility leads someone to have uh, a, a greater grip on their own future, if you will. If you really want to control where you're going in life, you need to step out and grab a hold of where you currently are. Um, you can't take a portion of who you are and blame it on, you know, the something, something in my brain or, you know, this or that or the other thing. Now, I'm going to, I do this often, so I'm going to do it now, but I'm, I am going to throw out the fact that, yes, there are real people who have real problems that are real medical issues, all right? There are chemical imbalances. There are uh, th growths in the brain, right. pressure. You know, Tumors. somebody that has sepsis is not thinking clearly. Right. These things exist. I'm not saying they don't, all right? And then, of course, you also have the spiritual causes. There are people who do things because they're demonically oppressed or, or possessed. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers and saying, oh, look at this person. He's such a horrible guy. He hurts himself, you know? Um, that's, that's not the point of this. What I'm saying is that you 
as an individual looking within. Don't look at anybody else. Don't make any claims about anybody else. Look inside yourself and look for where you're making excuses. Because where you're making excuses, you are causing yourself to be weak. You're saying, I don't need armor here because it's not my fault when I get hurt here. So when I get hurt here, I can just say, oh, well, that's not my fault. That's society fill in the blank. Me. So I'm not going to put any armor on. I'm just going to go marching into battle with no armor in this spot. And then I get poked there and I go, oh, yeah, I get poked there all the time. I'm used to this pain, but it's not my fault. You should feel sorry for me. And that's not how we can operate as spiritual warriors. All right. We have to be completely armored, which means we have to take complete responsibility for ourselves. Um, going back again to the Matthew scripture, it continues here. He says, ye have heard that it has been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, uh, and now I'm going to stop there. A lot of these things that he's referencing are in the law. Do you know where this is in the law? Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. It's not. Do you know where he's re referencing? It's going to be the extra biblical writing. Jewish of the, teaching, the right? Sages. Exactly. So um, that gives us a much more clear perspective on a lot of these other things he's referencing. Like if you scroll back and it says, uh, you know, for instance, you have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Is that in scripture? Why, yes, in fact, it is. Yeah. But what was it? Teaching on the law. It was not the law itself. It was taken as the law, but the law included 10 things. That's it. I mean, Jesus is even very clear that divorce was not something that God is okay with. No, that was Moses. Right? So if Moses said divorce was okay and therefore divorce became part of the law for the Jews, then the rest of those laws, which fall underneath the Ten Commandments, can be placed on the same level as divorce. They were okay ish but that doesn't mean that they are the moral law all right that does not make them fall under the same level as the ten commandments i am not going to condemn a person who gets a tattoo um your son who is rebellious does not need to be taken outside of the city and stoned uh and there is no need for us to slit the throat of any animal right. okay we have a lot in scripture that can guide us um and a lot of those laws can still guide us. But seeing how Jesus goes through those laws gives us an example of how we're supposed to go through those laws. Yes? Um, I don't know where, how you're going to wrap this up, but it looks like all of this stuff that he's talking about, the turn the other cheek stuff, is summed up from verse 45 to the end. It is. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So, um, again, it continues down. It says, you have heard that it has been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, this statement right here is the one that I'm going to say explains most clearly what he said previously. You'll notice Jesus keeps saying the same thing in two right. or three different ways, right? Um, and he previously already said, you heard that it has been said by them of old time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, if somebody steals your cloak, give him another one, right? Uh, resist not evil. But what does he mean when he says resist not evil? Well, you scroll down, and it says what? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Who's he talking about? Is he talking about demons? Is he talking about people? He's talking about people. Right. Right. So both of these sections are talking about the physical, not the spiritual. You remember I was talking last week that says physical versus spiritual. So that's what I meant by that. Yes, there is a clear divide here. One we're supposed to resist. The other we're not supposed to resist. But I put the air quotes up because resist means two very different things. All right. We are in a war with Satan. A war we're going to win, but we're in a war with Satan and the other, you know, nasty little icky creatures. Um, but we are not at war with the world. No. The world hates us. But we should be at peace with our neighbors. Right? The world hates us, but we are not at war with the world. The world is sick. Right. You, you don't fight sick people. You help them. 
right? So we have a perspective with them that I think Jesus most clearly explains with the, the, the servant, right? The, the ungrateful servant. The master forgave that servant, and then that servant goes and doesn't forgive somebody else who owes him. Come on, right? Everybody recognizes that that's not cool. We are the ungrateful servant in that scenario, right? We have the wonderful opportunity to have our debts forgiven to the master. So when we go out into the world, the world is like those who owe us debts, right? right? Every time they want to do something bad to us, if you want to look at it from a legalistic perspective, they're chalking up more bad on the list, all right? Their debt is growing to you. And sometimes that just does not feel good. And you can be like, man, that guy owes me a lot. He just smacked me in the cheek again. Mm, he's adding to that debt right there, right? But we have been forgiven so much that we can go ahead and turn around and forgive a little. Oh. And when I say forgive a little, I mean forgive a, little. a lot. All right? Like Corey Ten Boom. Right. I mean, look, what I did to God is by far worse than anything anyone could do to me. If you tortured me to death over the course of my entire lifetime, it would still not be as bad as what I did to God. And God forgave me for that. That's all I'm saying. And that's all he's saying here. Right? So we resist the evil that is implacable. We do not resist the evil that is sick. Right. Now, I drew the dividing line there because there are some people that are implacable. All right, and, and I'll, 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 define, I'll define my term. The implacable person is a man who will not be saved. Right. Now, God has the ability to save anybody. So do you and I get to define what an implacable person is or who that person is? Not really, right? If God wanted to, he could reach down, you know, and he could have reached down and been like, I am sovereignly saving Hitler. And you know what would have happened? He's sovereign. Hitler would have been saved. I, I, I get that. Now, that's not the way God operates. God is a gentleman. Right? But he could have. He so issues, He issues the call. He, he, he issues the call, right? But what we see happens is that people who act, act based on their own desires. Right? And they act based on their own will their own free will, which isn't free at all because they're bound by sin. They're, they're caught by the law of sin and death, as, as Romans puts it. So and would, that a person, be, would that be similar to Ramses? Get rid of these frogs whenever you want. Uh, tomorrow morning, let me spend one more night with the frogs. Well, that's just, you know. Well, I know, but he was absolute, no matter, he went back on his word every time. He had people killed all the time. He chased, he drove his enemy. I mean, I have I have no idea what was going through Ramsey's head, so I can't but, answer that But what question. I'm saying is that a, an image, a picture of someone who we could look at and go, I'm going to try and, no, and not fight no, that's, back. That's, that's, I don't fight back with right, this person. Exactly. That's not an implacable person, right? But what we do see is as an implacable person is the man who uh, is currently holding a gun to someone's head. And getting ready to pull the trigger. And, not, why, and, and enjoying it. Right. Why, why do I say that? Because I have the righteous, if you will, uh, justification in Scripture for defending life. Right. So, uh, and we can go into that, and that would be actually a great hard question to lift on our hard question sessions. Well, but, a while ago, unless I'm mistaken, you said, do not resist an implacable person. No, I did not. I, I thought that's what I heard. No. No, so... Um, you don't, you God, don't resist the sick, but the implacable are being Satan incarnate. Right. The, the, you, you have, you have the, the physical versus the spiritual, and we looked at that. Now you have the implacable person versus the sick person. Right Now what Jesus is talking about here is the physical versus the spiritual. And so this becomes a very difficult topic, and one that, like I said, is one that would very clearly fit into the hard questions. We really don't have time tonight to cover that topic. However... Um, there is a divide, but the, the very right, the very brief look at that is yes, there are opportunities, there are exceptions, if you will, in which it is okay for you to physically resist someone who is uh, perpetuating evil. Um, I can tell you what my belief is on that. 
but we would have to have a lot of time for me to walk you through the scripture as to why I came to that belief. Um, but my belief on that would be if someone's holding a gun to my head and is demanding my wallet, they get the wallet. I can give him my wallet. That's okay. If someone is holding a gun to my head and demanding that I give up Christ, no, I will not give up Christ. If someone is holding a gun to my wife's head and demanding that I give my wallet, you get the wallet. I'll get my wallet. And if he demands that I give up Christ, I will not give up Christ. It does not matter what is at stake, right? We can't give up Christ. Right. But if that same person is holding a gun to someone's head and requiring someone else to do something, and I happen to be in the shadows and I have my pistol and I can take that person out. I will. In that circumstance, I believe that that is acceptable. I believe that that's okay. In fact, I believe that God may have put me in that moment for that reason. I agree. Right. So that being said, do we need to be prepared sometimes to physically defend ourselves? Yes, I think we do. I think there is a time for that. And I can lead you through the scriptures for that at another time. But just to wrap that topic up, there are exceptions. But as a general rule, we are not out here fighting a physical uh, crusade for Christ. All right, We're not murdering and killing people who disagree with us. We're not going after abortionists. Okay, This right. is not what we do. OK, and, and sometimes those those lines are very hard to draw. They're very, very difficult to draw. You know, what makes it OK for me to defend an innocent life when I'm in the place here, but not to defend an innocent life when it's an abortionist getting ready to murder an unborn child? You know, the, these lines are very difficult to draw. They're very, very much gray areas. And again, I would love to walk through that during the hard question sessions. Um, but just to wrap this section up as we get to the end of Matthew chapter 5, um, as my father pointed out earlier, this whole section is talking about the physical versus the spiritual. And that physical versus the spiritual section comes to a head, if you will, in verse 44, where it says to love your enemies, bless them which curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your father which is in heaven. That's verse 45. For he mark, maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. And then it goes on in verse 46 to, to show the uh, even-handedness of God. He says, for if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect. And the word that he uses for perfect is complete. Be complete. Be even. Be like a circle. It has all 360 degrees. All right. Don't. Um, you know what I mean. Um, it, you you are not missing any portion of the pie. All right. If you're missing something, this is a problem. But if you're complete, even as your Father which is in heaven is complete, then you're going to be even-handed in each section. Right? He's not saying that we have to be perfect, i.e. never made a mistake. He's saying that we have to complete ourselves. All right? And this is something that's echoed throughout the New Testament. We see like establish, strengthen, and settle you. Right? right. That's another section which is talking about being complete, being completed. Um, so that wraps up Matthew chapter 5. Did we have any big questions on any of the topics that we've covered through Matthew chapter 5 before we go on to Matthew chapter 6? No, I think it's been good. Completion also reminds me of growing up to maturity, to handle it as you need to handle it. Sure. What, what I see in that wrap-up section that he had there, if God the Father sees that it's good for him to bless the just and the unjust with rain and sunshine, who are you to right. be more critical of them than he is we, we should not be in judgment of them any more than he is. If he's going to bless them evenly, then we should. If there's any more criticism to be made of them than what he has already, that's his job. That's right. Yep. And just to give an example, we have in Scripture someone who crossed the line with God. Several people, in fact. But we have a, a good example of someone who crossed the line with God a king who declared himself to be God, stood up before the people and said, I am God, right? And, and you know, God may send the rain on the just and on the unjust and the sun on the just and on the unjust, but that day he sent a nice good lightning bolt and turned the guy, it, it, it's open with, you know, uh, 
carrot with, with, with wormies worm. on the inside. He became a nice wormy guy. Uh, so there are there is a point where you can go beyond God's uh, grace. He he says that he will not strive with man forever. Right. So he does have limits. Therefore, clearly, if a person is still alive, God either has a reason for them to be alive, or they haven't crossed those limits. So Jesus' explanation here does make sense. And if you didn't hear what um, w was mentioned, um, this summary section from uh, verse 44 on is essentially saying that if God is as even-handed as uh, showing sun and rain on the just and on the unjust, then we need to be as well. Um, we can't be more critical than, than the judge of all the earth. All right, so um, that wraps up Matthew chapter 5. If you do have any questions on Matthew chapter 5 and you're listening in online, please put those questions in the comment section, and we will do the best that we can to, uh, to tackle those. Thank you for joining us tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for giving us one more opportunity to hear from you in Scripture and to look at the, uh, the truths that you have for us to try and pick up on a little bit more of your character. Uh, please help us to continue to keep our minds open and continue to, to delve into your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.